Okay, welcome special class. Uh, we're not doing the Parsha of the Week. <laughs> parsha, who cares about the Parsha of the Week? That's for a regular synagogue. We're better than that. <laughs> we're going to talk about a little known holiday called Yom Kippur. Never heard of it. What? Never heard of it. Never heard of it, right? Exactly. So, Yom Kippur, everybody knows, holiest day of the year. Just a little background on the history of Yom Kippur. What happened was the Jewish people sinned with the golden calf after the giving of the Torah. First, God wanted to wipe out the Jewish people for, the, for the, the grave nature of their sin. Then Moshe spends 40 days, well, the first 40 days he spent learning Torah. Second 40 days he asked, asking God, pleading with God to please spare the Jewish people. And actually, now I'm going to put my, my thing on do not disturb. So I, I'm not disturbed. And finally, the, and finally, the last 40 days, which started from the beginning of Elul and culminating with the 10th day of Tishrei, Moshe came down with the second tablets and the famous words that Hashem told Moshe, I have forgiven you, I have forgiven the Jewish people, rather, as you, Moshe, have requested. And ever since then, the 10th day of Tishrei has been a day of forgiveness and atonement. And, and, and thus we have the day of Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the holiest day of the year. It's the only time that we can fast on Shabbos. It supersedes Shabbos. In fact, Yom Kippur is called the Shabbos of all Shabbosim. N- nothing holier, greater than, um, uh, than Yom Kippur, uh, uh, by far. So Yom Kippur, is, uh, everybody knows, we bang our chest a lot. And, and we, we, we say, I'm sorry. Right. So, so now, and we, we try to be a better person. So l- let's start off with a question for discussion. All right? This is this is the this is the, 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 the um, on page one, one eighty. On a scale from one to five, one eighty. Getting to the back of the book, guys. On a scale from one to five, how true do you think the statement is about you? I am a good person. Depends on who you talk to. Six. Six. Come on, there you go, Larry. Should I ask what Barbara thinks says about you? <laughs> Nothing exceeds my goodness except my humility. Exactly. Uh, and it, it is really a lot more to say, but you're humble, so, you know. I'm humbler than most people. Exactly. <laughs> I, I, you just want to serve as an example to everyone else what it means to be humble. I get it. You're performing a public service but letting everyone know. Thank you, Larry. You're very kind. So I think most people, when you ask them, are you a good person? They say, yeah, I'm a good person, right? So now, follow up question. You're a good person. Do you have room for improvement? I think we always do. You always have room yeah. for improvement. Yeah, you always have room for improvement, right? And, and everybody has, has their own. Some of us need more improvement than others. And some of us are more perfect than others. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's why, that's why we all need a spouse in our life. Whenever we think we've made it, we've improved, we're finished. There's a comedian, he's, I think he's originally from Boston, he's hilarious. He's like, somehow in marriage, we're always working on me. I'm always the issue. My wife is like this museum piece behind glass, just to look at, admired. Of course. Says me, I'm like that building with scaffolding around it for 10 years. Everyone's walking by like, are they ever going to be finished with this piece of garbage? Like, what's going on? No, <laughs> I'm always the problem. Work in progress. <laughs> He's great. So that's what we're going to talk about, the, the, idea, uh, the idea of improvement. Comes Yom Kippur, and the theme of Yom Kippur, well, there are two mitzvahs of the day. The one mitzvah is to fast. Right? The commandment, you're not, you're not allowed to eat, you have to fast. The second mitzvah is not like what people think, just to suffer in, in, in temple. The more I suffer in temple, you know, the more... The, <laughs> the commandment is that you shall... Uh, afflict yourself. What's the word? Afflict. Afflict, yeah. But that's translated as not eating. What, what else? How? It, well, the, there are some sectors in... Christianity that they whip themselves. Oh, good, but this is this is a Jewish temple. If you want to go from Kippur to the Christian synagogue, whatever they want to call it, okay. Yeah. But they, that's how they interpret afflict. I don't care what how they interpret. It. They have no they have no authority to to um, interpret. It's our Torah. We uh, we dictate to you what it means. You don't have an opinion. 
You can't come 1,500 years after the Torah was given, you meaning Christianity, after the Torah was given and decide to have an opinion about what it means. It doesn't work that way. We are the authority, Jewish people, not you. Just like, for example, I'm not an authority in the New Testament. If you tell me whatever it means, okay, that's your Bible, I guess so. I mean, I'm, I'm, how would I know? Imagine I walked into a mosque and like, all you guys, you don't know what Muhammad's saying. I know. What are we talking about? No, it's a height of stupidity and arrogance. Anyway, but the rabbis learn out. If you want, you could open up a, a, a tractate, Yuma, and it talks about exactly how the rabbis uh, surmised affliction meaning food. But that's, that's not for this class. The second obligation of, of Yom Kippur is Teshuvah. What does Teshuvah mean? So usually people say Teshuvah means repentance. You've heard me say before, that's not a good, that's not a good um, explanation. A good, a good translation. Now, repentance or teshuva is not only for bad people. People have done things wrong. Teshuva is for everybody. Look at what Maimonides say is, says in text number 18 on page 181. Yom Kippur, the time of teshuva for all, both the individuals and the community at large. It is the apex of forgiveness and pardon. And for Israel, accordingly, everyone. Everyone, everyone meaning everyone, including the good guys. Huh? Every Jew. Including the good guys. Including the righteous the people. Guys. No, for the bad guys. Everybody. I mean, the bad guys have to do Teshuva for sure. What we're going to talk about today is if you're a good guy, then what are you doing Teshuva for? This is what we have to explain in, in, in Maimonides. It's to everyone in this, in this text, it's to all. It's, it's the comprehensive, all-inclusive. In Judaism, don't we consider all prayers offered by the individual for the community as opposed to for the individual? No, but you're personally, you're personally teshuva. Yeah, but I, my davening is for my personal benefit and for the community, not just well, for me. Well, we, you, the, the prayers are heard best as a community. Your individual prayers are heard best when you pray as a community. Because the community, an individual is judged individually. Community is judged as a whole. As, as a whole, your individual misgivings or mistakes are a lot less noticeable. Which is why we should, it's better to pray with a minion. That's why you have to download a minion, yep. That's why you have to come to show, yep. And that's also the reason. Mean one on Thursday. <laughs> exactly. And uh, there you go, good plug. Um, and that's why you say we, that we sinned, right? The things that we did together. Although maybe you've never done these things. But hopefully some of these things in the prayer you've never done. Otherwise our friendship is about to be over, right? <laughs> but, um, but because... Well, that's a goal. I didn't you know, know we had a friendship. <laughs> exactly, right? Some people look at it as a goal to be able to say, I... Right, exactly. Um... But then, but then, but then, um, but because of the Jewish people exist as a community and we're all interconnected, so when someone in the community is, is, is misbehaving, so to speak, it affects the entire community. Unlike, I guess, in Western modern culture, that you can do whatever you want, it doesn't affect the community as, at large. That's not true. We don't believe, Ju Judaism doesn't believe that. A person doing something affects, affects everyone. Anyway, so let's, let, let's look at the continuation of, of uh, what Maimonides says. He says, he says it's, um, it isn't just called a day of atonement. He says, even though repentance and calling out to God is, is desirable all the time. You do something wrong, you want to get connected to God, you could do it, you know, in, in February. But Yom Kippur, the time between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is very auspicious. And particularly the, the day of Yom Kippur, that is when he says, seek God where he's found. When is he found? On Yom Kippur. So you can, uh, you know, if I, if I know, let's say for example, on, on your birthday is a time that you're in a good mood and you're in a giving mood. So, and I, and I need a favor from you. When am I going to call you up? On your birthday. Now, even though maybe I can ask you a favor for the whole year. But if I need something from you and I know at a certain time you're going to be in a good mood, that's, you know, so for example. Depends on how old you are. Yeah, depends on how old you are. <laughs> Okay. So, for example, we see in the Torah when, on Paro's birthday, for example, right? He reinstated the butler, right? That was a good time, and Yosef came out 
I'm, I'm just giving an example, right? So Yom Kippur, although obviously could pray to God and beseech God all the time, obviously, it's not like God's on vacation. You know, he, he, he's only, isn't that a great job? He works 10 days a year, right? So, no, God's always in the office, but these 10 days, he's, he's particularly open to, he's open to, to Shuvah. But in the words of the Rambam, prayer in the times of, in the times of Yom Kippur is immediately accepted. During the rest of the year, God's like, eh, should I, shouldn't I, what has he done? You know, what have you done for me lately, kind of thing. But in Yom Kippur, in Yom Kippur, in, in Chassidus talks about why this is. In Yom Kippur, it's, um, it's an open relationship, and Teshuvah is automatically accepted. So now, um, so the question is like this. Teshuvah means you did something wrong, right? What if you didn't do anything wrong? Are you going to confess to something you didn't do? Yeah, there you go. Why am I confess? Why am I confessing to something I didn't do? It's a lie. No, aren't we doing it as as a community? No, but when you but when you when you confess, it's you, you it's you, and everybody and everybody confesses. Everybody. You have the potential. <laughs> oh, that's that, that's uh, that's true. The potential of doing something wrong. Yeah, yeah. And that's for sure. So that's why you're repenting. Because you got that potential. You thought, right? about, you thought about it because it's you like read the, the word, right? There. It's, it, it's like a guy comes home, his wife is upset. He knows he did something wrong. <laughs> he doesn't know what he did yet, but he knows he's in trouble. Hey, that's the old story. When the kid comes home from school, whack him. He knows what he did, even if you don't. Right. <laughs> <laughs> when I was in elementary school, I had a hard time because my aunt was a teacher in the school. So if I did something wrong, I knew my mom was going to find exactly. out about it. So... <laughs> What was that? I don't know. The door's just... That's weird. Did the door... Did the, Somebody's saying... Or, or, or the wind. Maybe lightning. We're taking... We're we're, we're, the, the, the ghosts of Chabad are coming to the class. Maybe it, was, maybe it was the door. Maybe it was the wind. No, maybe it was... It was uh, uh, Michael J. And then he remembered he had to go to the bathroom before he came in. Or maybe... Or maybe Elijah the prophet. I know he usually comes around Passover. Yeah, but, but he, he waits for someone to open the door. He's very polite. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we weren't there with a candle, so he turned away. Maybe, maybe he realized it's the wrong holiday. All right, come. Yeah, it was just the wind. That's, wow. It must be very windy outside. Okay. So, so the question, we're holding two questions. Number one, we said Teshuvah, teshuvah is an obligation on Yom Kippur. The question is, what if... What if you haven't done anything wrong? And number two, why Yom Kippur? Why not, you know, why, you know, what if you feel like repenting, you know, in July? Usually people don't feel like that because you're usually well, you partying. Usually you got to repent for what you did in July. <laughs> but, uh, but I can't imagine, no matter how good a person you are, that you've gone through an entire year without doing one thing. Oh, yeah? That's it. Right. You, you, you got to stay, you got to stay for, you, you got to stay for, no, you're right, most people. If the Rambam would have wrote, written that the majority of people have to sin, or, or you know, but let's take for example the Rambam. Yeah. Okay. You know, or or, or let's take Moshe Rabbeinu. Did Moshe Rabbeinu? Moshe had a bad day. He whacked the rock. That wasn't a bad. Thing. <laughs> right. Was it? Let's let's take Moshe. Do you think Moshe did, said Al Chait on Yom Kippur? Sure, he did. The Rebbe. What did you, what did you, no? And uh, how can that how such a person? So for me, obviously, and for most of us, obviously, we we have plenty. In fact, Yom Kippur should be more than twenty five hours. I have so many sins. <laughs> you Speak know, it, it, it's not it's, it's not enough time. Okay, you know, it's like it's like the IRS cannot file an extension, right? <laughs> but but so the question is, why is everyone doing the shuva, and also why you know that that day? And we see everyone has to do it. The, the, the Rabbi Yonah of, of uh, Girona writes in Shari Shiva, he says it's proactive obligation from the Torah for each person to rouse the spirit and return to God with the Shiva Anyam Kippur. It has to be Anyam Kippur. Obviously, you do something wrong in the middle of the year, you don't say, okay, fine. You know, imagine a guy steals from another guy. I'll pay. I know I, I stole from you. I'll pay you back in September. No, no, no. I'll, 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 thank you. I'll take my money now. So God will take the repentance now. But no, we say Yom Kippur is something different. What's different about the Shuvah and Yom Kippur than year round? Okay. 
let's first uh, uh, let's first get to the the, the first problem we, we're talking about is you know that the fact that we're all we're all repenting. Not that we're all, we're all repenting. We're saying the same al chet every year. We never learn. We never learn, right? <laughs> we have short term memory. Was that bad? Oh man, I knew I uh, right. So, so you know, so a, a guy doesn't have air. Right? Let's say he does proper teshuv. Right? Let's say he did proper teshuv. Means you feel contrite, you regret, you don't do it again. If you come back, if you come in and say, "What's today? Today is it's a Tuesday, September nineteenth, the fourth of Tishrei." So, Rabbi, I did something terrible and I feel bad. I'll, I'll never do it again. You come back to me, September nineteenth, twenty twenty-four, Dalat Tishrei, whatever it is, it's gonna be. So, Rabbi, I did something very bad. I'll never do it again. You know, were you here a year ago? And you said you felt very bad. And you were gonna do it again. Like I don't. What kind of teshuva is that? You repeat. I didn't do that. I did something else. Right. <laughs> I did it to someone else. I did it better. I did it better. Exactly. <laughs> right. I'm improving. So I, I now I sin better. Right. So, so you know. So if you if you if you um, you do something wrong, you do teshuva. But if you look at the Raman's words, he says everyone has to do teshuva, and then we start we start repenting. It's and. And declare, I'm saying declaring, because you're supposed to say it to yourself. We don't, you know, say it aloud. Actually, it says in halacha, we're not supposed to say, oh, I sin, I'm a big sinner. It's kind of like you're bragging. It's a chutzpah. Repenting has to be, you know, you know the old joke about repentance. We're talking about Christians, right? Whenever you need, when you need a good joke, you could, you could always rely, rely on those guys. This guy hadn't been to confession in a very, very, very long time, right? So he comes into the confession booth and he sees whiskey, there's a TV, there's an all felt and everything else. He has a guy come in, and all sides says, says, forgive me, Father. Um, I haven't been to confession in a long time, since I can tell you, idiot, you're in my box. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, so we, the al are, are are lined up by the olive base. There are two al chaits for each for each letter. You see in text number three. Where are we? Text number three. You see over there it says, "But in this ratzay, I mean, look past the first uh, past the first four uh, words. Be imas alev before I, I, I acted on, on the compulsion and I think, oh, these are you know it, it goes on, it, um, it, it goes on. So why, the question is, why are we repeating the same list every year? You know, if, if Hashem, if Hashem did, if someone did something, and and you and you and you're contrite, and you did proper tshuva, why are you coming back next year and, and, and saying it again? And, 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 and let and wait a second. And let's it's say you standard form, standard form, right? And let's say you said, and you said, I'm sorry, and God forgave you. What are you apologizing again for? How many times you got to apologize? I get it. You're sorry. I mean, what is God? Is God like a teenage girl that's you know, you know, is holding on to some grudge? Well, what's going on here? How many times are you going to apologize for the same mistake? You apologize, and and you are forgiven. So, so maybe if you're apologizing, that means that means you didn't do proper tshuva. It means you have to endlessly apologize. That means you'll never be forgiven. So what are we doing here? Mela. Either way, either God forgave you, stop apologizing. If he didn't forgive you, then there's no chance. What's the point of starting? You with me? Mm-hmm. So, so, um, it's a, and you were saying, right? And, and, and you're praying in vain. Let's say you didn't do these things. What am I saying I'm sorry for if I never, you know? So let's say I feel bad that I... I killed an endangered uh, uh, white, white rhino. I never, I never, I never did such a thing. What are you confessing for? You heard about the uh, the Libyan lady that got bit by a rattlesnake. Who? Up, up in the middle of part of the state, a uh, the Amazon. Amazon lady got bitten and severely by a rattlesnake, and she had to get to the hospital quickly. Okay. This rattlesnake was the, was an eastern uh, diamondback. It's an okay. endangered species. Oh, really? But the cop killed it anyway. Oh, yeah. All right. So, so some people, some commentaries explain why are we 
repeating the same thing, because like I think you guys said, one of I were, one of you guys said, is because we have the potential. Yeah, you did it. Maybe you did it once, so you're re you're reuttering it as as a prevention from making the same mistake. I made the mistake, and I sort of don't want to fall into the trap and doing it again. Look at text number five. Ah, uh, four. Sorry, Moshe Trani, or Moshe Trani, uh, uh, Rabbi Moshe of Trani. I mean, he's originally from Greece, but he moved to Svas. He was the rabbi of Svas for like 50, 60 years. And he says, a person isn't required to do teshuva for past sins for which he already repented. But they are certainly required to repeatedly articulate them so they don't ever fall, uh, repeat the same mistakes. But as far as teshuva is concerned, the person has resolved never to repeat the mistake. And they've acknowledged that it was their yetzahara, the evil snake, who seduced them, so the original teshuva uh, remains in place. You know, you know, I'm talking about teshuva. This guy got into, guy got into I got into a big fight with his, with his wife and screamed at his kids. And he woke up. I mean, he woke up next morning and he realized that what, what was the reason? It was alcohol. And he saw a bunch of bottles of, of, MD, of MD beer. So he picks up that one empty bottle of beer and he throws it against the wall and says, you're responsible for me getting to fight my wife. Picks up another one and says, you're responsible for me smashing some. He, and he throws another empty bottle of beer. And he, and he says, you're responsible for me screaming at my kid. Then he picks up another bottle is full. Puts it down. You weren't involved. You, you're standing there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so now we're getting. So now we're going to get into something a little, a little bit. It's a little bit hairy, but it, it's a, but it's a deep concept. So you, you have to, like they say, in Hal Cup, you have to kind of. I catch up. You have to, the, the idea. You have to. It's a little bit of a hard, not hard, but difficult concept to, to internalize because at first, not because, it's, not because it's essentially difficult, because it doesn't agree with us at first. And that is, our actions remain with us forever. The good and the bad, right? Just like for example, you, you, your good actions are, are, are held in your, are held in your, for your, in your favor. The bad actions, even after you do teshuva, the fact that you did it makes you feel bad. So let's say, for example, right? Let's say you did something when you're 10, right? And you, you felt bad when you're 10. And then when you, later when you're thinking back, man, I was one stupid kid. But when you're, you were 10, you felt bad. So why, why are you feeling bad now? Because now you've grown as a person. So the action bothers you. Every step you take as a, as a person, as you grow, your past acts, either give you pleasure or give you shame. So let's say, you know, a neshama leaves the body. One of the, what, one of the hell the neshama goes through is, and the pleasure, is it gets to witness all the actions it did in its life. The good, the bad, and the ugly. So when it does a mitzvah, the neshama gets pleasure. Oh, look, I did that. A neshama does, does a, does a nevera, it's very shameful because I was an idiot. Ah, you were in a body, and he didn't, and the neshama didn't have the clarity it has now. Now, once the neshama leaves the body, of course it has clarity, and of course the actions are very clear. But then, but then, the, the, the neshama was obscured in the body. It was harder to make the right decision. So why do you feel guilty? Why do you feel guilty? But you, you do feel guilty. Why? Because at where you are now, you've grown. So your past sins bother you. Does that make sense? Not so much that you're held accountable for it, you're being punished, not being punished. You yourself, you're sort of disappointed in yourself at your new level. And that's what it means when King David says, you see in text number 5a, this is what the, it says, Rabbi Elezer ben Nakiv says, um, and this is why we, Elezer ben Nakiv says, we should repeat our old, our old sins, because text 5a, page 184 says, like King David says, for I know my transgressions, and my sin is always, is always before me. Uh, and, and this is what, and this is the, this, this is the answer that Maimonides gives. This is why we repeat. Because maybe this year you haven't done it, but, if, but you've grown older and wiser. <clears throat> hopefully. Not, hopefully not more older and more uh, foolish. You've grown older and wiser. You, you, hopefully you're a better person, Rosh Hashanah 5784, than you were 5783. That's the idea. If you're the same or worse, that's the problem. Hopefully everyone's a little bit better. So you look back, 
look back, and the reason why we repeat it, the, the Maimonides says in text 5b, is because that's part of the tshuva. It's because, um, he says that you should, you should, um, you should know that, that the sins are, are, always be, are, are always before me, meaning that they're always, bo- they're, always bo- they're always bothering me. And this is what Rashi means when he says, you see text number, uh, um, he says in Tixay, Tixay, they're always with me. You can never c- completely wipe away um, the sin. Now, in the beginning, it seems very, it seems very disappointing or, 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 or depressing. So he's saying every time I, I did something wrong, I, I can never wipe it away. I, it, it'll always haunt me. It's not. It's not. It's not a question of. It, it's not a question of um, of haunting you. It, it, it's a question of of motivating you to get better. Now, now you're at a different level. So, <clears throat> so in Teshuvah, by the way. Let's get into Shuvah, let's get into Teshuvah also. Many people think the shuvah is only. I once had this debate with a doctor, and his 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 position was the shuvah is only for actions, or hurtful things you say, which is an action. But I can think whatever I want. What do you, what do you, what do you believe? Is thinking. Think about Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Jimmy Carter. That that that's Israel. You can think negatively. Is thinking is thinking hateful or immoral thoughts? Is, is that an aver? I can see where it, where you can make the argument that it is. Okay, and why why is it not? It's not because it only becomes an aver if you act. So, 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 according to Jewish philosophy, they, they, they don't agree with that. And you're learning in Tanya, no, no, this is why we're here. The learning in Tanya, thinking is an action. So, let's get into the, what we were talking about before. Everyone has to do to show. And like Barbara said, who hasn't done something wrong in the, in the course of the year? So, usually when we think of something wrong, Larry, you want to wait? Uh, usually, <laughs> usually when we think of doing something wrong, we think of an action or something we said. If you look at what the Navi says, Ishaya says in text 7a, Ishaya says that every that the wicked shall shall give up his way. And the man, look at this, the iniquity uh, of iniquity is taught. It means I wonder how much of the class was. I wasn't. No, 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 it was going. It was going. Okay. Just, so we'll have to find a, have to find a way to combine up the videos. Anyway. So the um I lost my train of thought. So that so the idea is sorry, so the idea is so the idea is that thinking is an action. When you dwell on something, that's an action. So the, 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 the idea, so for thinking something immoral, or, oh, this is what I wanted to get to. According to halacha, you're not allowed to think business on Shabbos. You, you, you're not allowed to think business. Like for example, you can't make calculations and stuff on Shabbos. Don't think of a brown cow. Yeah, exactly, right. <laughs> No, but no, no, no. But but the idea is why? Because on Shabbos, for example, you're supposed to be separate from business. So let's take it. Let's take it for example. Let's get, you know, a guy comes home from work, right? And he can't and he can't pay attention to his wife and kids, his family. Why? Because he's totally consumed. What happened to work? He, physically, he's home, but he's not. So, you know. So I mean, for example, you go out. You go out. At, uh, you go out to eat with somebody. Right, and your the person's talking to you, and you're dreaming, you're not present. Thinking is an action. You're a tailor. You come into show on Shabbos, and you see how people are dressed terribly. How can you not think about it as a tailor? I ain't say, say think about business. Thinking, oh, I, I, but if you think I'm going to go over to this guy, and I'm going to try to sell him a suit. That's well. Listen, the, 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 you got to come to the Tanya class. But basically, no, 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 no. But basically, very, very, very short. There's a difference between thought and thinking. It's not the same. A thought pops into your head. Thinking is what you actively decide to dwell on. You can choose what to think about. You can't choose the thoughts that pop into your mind. So if you walk in, and, and the guy walk, I mean, you walk at the show. You're a tailor, for your example. And the guy's wearing a bad suit. And says, you know, I could really sell that thought. And he says, oh no, Shabbos today, and it's not in the sense. So. 
That's or the story I told with the two brothers with the safe, right on the first night of Rosh Hashanah. That their store, the jewelry store, was broken into. No. So the thought was pro popping into their head: Oh, we got to do something. But instead, they said, "No, it's Shabbos." Again, we're not talking about thought; we're talking about thinking. So when you when you when you we set the bar the barometer, not the barometer, but the 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 bar that high for what's considered iniquity or something wrong, then we start including a lot more people. A lot of people don't steal. A lot of people don't c c commit immoralities. Or a lot, of, you know, don't say hateful things, but inside, inside here, or there, right? you know, you know, you know, one more word, you know, so Jack, like Jackie Mason's. So now we can already include a lot, a lot of people. Look at what, what Maimonides says: what constitutes an avera. Text seven B on page one eighty seven. A person should not think that repentance is only necessary for sins involving deeds, such as promiscuity, robbery, or theft. Rather, just as a person must repent from these. So must he search his evil character traits. You must repent from anger. Anger is a sin. Hatred, envy, frivolity, the pursuit of money and honor, gluttony and the like. You must repent from all of the above. These sins are more difficult than those involving deed. Because deed, it's very concrete. I did it, I need, I need to repent. But with, with my thoughts or I feel something, it's a lot harder. This is what he means, when, with, with, with the prophet Ishaya means, that the wicked abandon his path and the crooked man um, he, he's uh, his designs. So you know, say so again, if one day a person's having a bad day, then you know you have to uh, you, you have to correct it because a year is a unit. If one part is missing, then then you gotta correct it. So teshuva means teshuva means like this. Teshuva really means return, or reforging the connection with Hashem. Every day is an opportunity to embellish that connection or, God forbid, compromise that connection. If one day, even one day, or one part of the day, the person did not, did not maximize or utilize that connection with Hashem, so that, that, that it's lacking. So what do you got to do? You got to try to make it right. That, uh, that's what the Shiva is. So far, any questions? Good. All right. Let's uh, let, let's look at um, let's look what the Alter Rebbe says. Alter Rebbe is going to say like this: Every day you're growing. Every day uh, you're moving. You're moving. To, you're moving closer. Every day you're maturing. Every year, obviously. So you look back and you, and he says, not that the teshuva is, but not that the teshuva is not for, is not accepted. Not that you, you're going to be punished. It's that, that that act bothers you. Look at what he says in text 8a. This is in Tanya, and on um, page, um, on page, um, it's a chapter 29. Hashem, will get there. It could very well be that one has done complete shiva. Still, it's not enough. Why? Because shiva is primarily a duty of the heart, and the heart has many layers and complexities. Each person, according to the conditions of the era and their environment. So when a person observes that they are spiritually numb. That is an indication that the teshuvah has not been accepted and their paths obstructed between them and God. A deeper level of teshuvah is necessary from a deeper pocket of the heart. And thus David says, my sins are, um, are, ever, are ever before me. So, the more sensitive you are, the more you feel, the more you bother by your past deeds. So the teshuvah then was good enough. So let's say you, let's say, Let's say, for example, you did something terrible about you. God forbid. Let's say a person did something really bad. And he was, ten, he was a bully. He did something really bad to another kid. Made the kid really feel bad. Embarrassed the kid in public. You know, something like that. And he apologized. And now you grew older. And you apologized. Let's say you apologized. Your parents made you feel bad. And you apologized. And you grew older. And that act bothers you. So you call the guy up and you say, you know, I really want to apologize how I acted as a kid. Do you apologize when you're 10? Why are you apologizing again? Because that past act bothers you. So this is what Rashi means, that the stain stays with you. It moves with you. As you grow, as you mature, and hopefully, um, you know, maturing sp uh, spiritually, so, th th so, you have, so you have to take into account. And this is where a person needs uh, personal honesty. you got to know exactly where you stand. One of the chapters in Tanya, the Altar Rebbe talks about, person not get, being honest with himself. 
it will, um, you know, uh, what do they call it when you assess a house? His assessment is way too high. What do you, when they appraise, his appraisal is way too high. And the bank ain't buying it. And the guys the bank ain't buying it. So for example, in, in one of the chapters over there in Tanya, talks about a guy who can't understand why he has evil or selfish, indulgent impulses. So I serve God the whole day. So the Rebbe says, why shouldn't you? You're a human being. Why shouldn't you have those? And the very fact that you even think of that it's not possible means you're not honest with yourself. So if you're honest with yourself, then the past deeds will bother you. Not so much the fact that you rectification and say, I'm better than that. And the question is like you see on the screen, what did I do, to my, what did I do today to, to prove myself from yesterday? Every day has to be better than yesterday. There's a, there's a saying in Yiddish which, which says, Morgan, Tomorrow is going to be totally different. That's growth. So the fact that we did in the past, what we did in the past has to be, has to motivate us to be, to be better in the future. There's a good story, I'm talking about being honest with yourself. There's, um, there's a good story with, with, with Levi Yitzchak Levi Yitzchak I know that story. Yeah, I know. So he, he married a girl from a non-Hasidic family. I mean, he, I mean, he lived right at the beginning, the infancy of the Hasidic movement. So his father-in-law wasn't a very big fan of the Hasidic movement. But he went to, he went to, uh, he went to Mezrich, learned from the Magid, and he came back. He had to come back after six months, I think it was. And his father-in-law wasn't, wasn't very impressed with him. But the town people were. So when they came to Simchas Teira, they wanted him to be chaz. So he comes up, he comes up to the Amid, to the uh, podium, and he puts on his talus. And he's about to start, and he takes it off. And then he puts on the talus, and then he takes it off. He puts on his talus, and finally he screams, if you're such a big chassid, you be the chassid. And he, and, and he walked away. His father-in-law was mortified. He was so embarrassed. So afterwards, they asked him, what's going on? So they came up, because you guys asked me to be chassid, so I was feeling all good about myself, right? I'm a chassid, I'm gonna, you know, I'm, you know I, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna lead the, the congregation, so who came to me? My Yitzhahara, the evil inclination says, eh, you think you're such a big chassid? He says, eh, you're not the big chassid. You, you went to Mezrich and you learned. You're, 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 no, no, you're, you're, you're nobody. I was trying to fight with him. Finally, I said to him, my Yitzhahara, if you're such a big chassid, you be the chassid. And, and I walked away. Now, what makes the story special is that I believe Yitzchak was honest with himself to realize that he still had room to improve. That's what made him, that's what made him special. That, uh, that's why... Um, that's why it's a story. And that's what you see what the, what the Alter Rebbe says. It's not, that, it's not that you look at yourself and you say, oh, I'm a sinner, I'm a terrible person, like, you know, those guys who whip themselves and all that. You know, I, I'm never good enough. You know, that, and we, I, we, I spoke about it on Rosh Hashanah, and we speak about it a lot, how a person can never um, sell themselves short, uh, incapable. No. But a person always has to have in mind that if I was capable of doing it once, I'm capable of doing it again. So it's always, before you get all arrogant about yourself and, oh, look at me, you know, I'm a big scholar and I'm a big this and I'm a big chas and I'm a big this, you know, everything else, relax. You know, the, the, you know there's a saying, a navi be a person can't be a prophet in his own city. You ever, ever, ever told you this thing before? You, you, want to, you want to know why? The guy comes up and says, thus says the word of God. Yeah, thus says the word of God. I remember when you were walk, running around the shoal, you know what I'm saying, making noise. Hey, you're going you're, you're gonna to tell me the word of God. You know what I'm saying? That, they, you know, that's what it... Uh, I always say, every, every rabbi, one of the good things about going to the Chabad conference of rabbis, is every, I, I, to my opinion, every rabbi, rabbi has to go. Why? Because some rabbis, you know, are big rabbis, they're big synagogues, they're very, very important. Sometimes you get a little hold of yourself. You got to go back to the Crown Heights and be stand in the back of the show, get pushed around, and you no, know, it's good. It's good for your, it's good for everyone's ego, and not, not to get too ahead of yourself. So I after is saying, yeah, yeah, you're, you're very fully capable. Just remember what once happened, because if it once happened, it can happen again. Look what he says in text AB. He says, Masha Kosuf, and what it says, Samid, that my sins are always opposite me, doesn't mean that we have to be depressed. God forbid, because. Of, uh, King David says very soon afterwards, make me uh, hear joy and gladness. Rather, the Sid must be before me, which Rashi means from a distance. The idea is to one keep, from keep getting uh, one, um, too arrogant and instead to maintain a sense of humility um, to all other people. This is a result of keeping one's sin constantly um, uh, uh, before them. So now we can understand what's, um, what it is 
about um, what it is about uh, about shuvah. The whole year, the whole year, when you do the shuvah, you're doing the shuvah for a certain act. You're trying to correct a certain act, but on Yom Kippur, you're correcting the fact that you didn't live up to your capability, and everybody falls short of the, uh, the capacity. Everybody. That's what you know. My Shabbat was very humble. Why? Because he thought, yeah, I've accomplished great things, but could be someone with with my capabilities would achieve a lot more. Perhaps I'm not living up to my capacity. Can you imagine my Shabbat is saying that? But if he says that, we could all, that's what Yom Kippur is for. Yom Kippur is to repent or so to return to try to get to the most you. Look what the Rebbe says in text, text 9. Uh, Yom Kippur is about deepening the connection. Here is the distinction. What, what, uh, when the reason for the Shuvah is contingent about the person and their sins. Then in situations the person either didn't sin or already performed the Shuvah, there's no further obligation to do the Shuvah for that sin. Why? You sinned, you rectify it, good. L -l -l Let's say L'chaim. This is despite the fact that in theory the sin remains before me. Because legally he did the shiva. Legally, what did the shiva mean? Stop sinning. Bill Cosby had the joke. So there's one cow talking to another cow. So they're all going to get killed. Why? Because we have a, a, a hoof and mouth. So what can we do about not, not to get killed? He says, take your foot out of your mouth. Right? What, what, old, 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 okay. <laughs> uh, old Bill Cosby joke. So, so, uh, so legally, what does the shiva mean? Stop sinning. Shiva means stop sinning and, and, and fill that time with, with good. But on Yom Kippur, it's a time that a person places an obligation on, 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 not, on anyone's personal affairs. Accordingly, if there was anything in one's life that ever required shiva, they must do shiva again. Meaning, because that means to deepen the connection, to get better, to grow. And that applies... Um, uh, 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 that applies to everybody. This is what the Rebbe says in text number in, in text number ten. You did good last. You did shiva last year. Good. You, you you did you grew last year. Good. Now now let's do more. That was one of the things that that was a little bit oh, intimidating. But that was one of the things that the Rebbe was always pushing you. You did good. Good. Let's do more. A person is always capable. Always capable to uh, to do more. To to always improve. Now, even. You're a good guy. And this is what he's saying with, 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 with him, Kippur. Because the, because the um, it says on, on, on text number 10, on Yom Kippur, every Jew is elevated to a new heights, right? We're wearing white, we're like angels. Um, even if someone did adequate shuva for something in the past in Yom Kippur, they must do a deeper, higher level of shuva. In other words, Yom Kippur makes, tunes you gets rid of the schmutz and makes you more spiritual attuned. As such things in the past, before Yom Kippur, maybe would not have considered a, a sin, but now, why, on the side, why can't you, why can't you eat on Yom Kippur? Why can't you wear, wear, wear leather shoes on Yom Kippur? Why are you going to do all these crazy things? I, I, I can't do the shiva, you know, if, I, if I'm wearing leather shoes. Ever? Ever stop to ask that question? I don't know. Rabbi said, don't eat. I don't eat. No leather shoes. Remember in the old days when all shoes were leather? You had to have special Yom Kippur shoes. There was no such thing as synthetic. Remember that? Yeah, simple. Yeah, everyone, had, everyone in the closet had Yom Kippur shoes. Synthetic. It was, it was made out of... Uh, canvas. Canvas. Yeah. These days, you, you can't find shoes that are leather. Um, the reason why you can't eat... And the reason why you, you can't that do it. goes back to what we were talking in the beginning, because not eating is discomfort. Right, but the spiritual reason, right? Yeah, it's true. Well, why does you? Why do you want to be discomfort? Why do you, God want you to afflict yourself, your bodies? The reason is because in order to be spiritually attuned, you got to put aside the material a little bit. In Kippur's a day, in Kippur's a day. Let's say, for example, a guy's getting married, right? A very important day in your life. He comes in, and the day of the wedding, he's watching football or doing something. Like, hey, dude, it's a very special day in your life. Don't you think you should be preparing, doing something, you know? And Kippur is a very, very special day. It's a day of a tremendous spiritual um, expression, the day of heightened connection between a Jew and God. It's not a day to be focused on food. It's not a day to be focused on how you look and, and, and what you wear. It's a day to, to tune out everything else and zero in on the connection with Hashem. And anything that once, you know, 
dirty to sully that connection is going to bother you. And Yom Kippur is all about getting stronger, better from one year to the next. Let me play for you a video of an interview. Hold on a second. It, it, this is text number 11, but I, instead of, instead of, instead of, um, Instead of reading it, you can hear it from the guy. What's that? So first, the introduction. Professor David Weiss was a leading scientist in the area of cancer immunology and immunotherapy. In 1965, while conducting research at the University of California, Berkeley, he traveled to the Soviet Union to take part in a medical conference held in Sukhumi in the Soviet Republic of Georgia. And then I asked the Rebbe a question. Maybe it was a bit of a chutzpah, but I asked the Rebbe, who can call yourself a one of your Hasidim? He said, I don't wear the clothing of a Chabadnik. I am not as uh, careful about all Shmirat Mitzvot as the people who are your Shlichim are. Who calls himself a one? And I said, you've, I've been with you for several hours and I'm profoundly impressed. And he said, he smiled and remembered it very distinctly. And he put his uh, arm on the desk and he said, ganz einfach, I remember it was very simple. And then he said to me, if a person who can look back at the end of the day and feel that he has advanced ethically, morally, uh, Jewishly, a small step above where he was at the beginning of the day, I shall, I forgot what we, I'll be happy, I shall be glad, I will call one of my Hasidim. That was a very powerful message. So that, that's what the, um, that's what the Rebbe is saying. Uh, to, be, to be a Hasid, what does Hasidus want from you? Hasidus wants that every day you get a little bit better. So we started off the class asking, are you a good person? Yeah, I'm a good person. But you have room for, room for improvement? Everyone has room for improvement. No matter how good you are, you always, you always have room for improvement. And, 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 and if you haven't improved, if you haven't fulfilled your capacity, that's a sin. You know, you know what the word sin really is? Chet. Chet doesn't mean sin, by the way. Chet means lacking. You missed the mark. That's what chet means. If you haven't, if you haven't fulfilled your capability to do good, that's a sin. I'll f- finish off with the story. Right, and, and then you guys are dismissed to go home. The Yankees are playing. Sorry. I'm kidding. I don't know. We'll see. We'll, we'll see what's going on. All right. So Rabbi Sadia Goen was a leader of Iraqi Jewry in the, in the 900s. He was a very, very, very great rabbi. And, and he had, and he had, um, and, and um, he had many, many uh, hundreds of, hundreds of, of students and, and he was a very, he was a great, great man, hundreds and thousands. He was literally the leader of world, world Jewry. And one day he decided, it was, the, the honor was getting to his head. That he was gonna take upon himself some, some a, a, a term of exile. Basically means he'd go in regular clothing. I guess the rabbis wore distinctive clothing. And, he, and you know, this before obviously photography. No one knew who, who he was. And this way, you know, he put him back in his place. Even though he's a great man, so and he would try. And it's, so what happened was the students, the students, but um, caught up. You know, were trying constantly trying to catch up to him. One time he came to a, he came to an inn, and he ate there. Whatever it is, the guy was a nice guy. Then he ate, left. Not too long after he, right, he ran for change. <laughs> Not too long after he left, his students were hot on his tail. Called him and said, "Was Rabbi Sadia going here?" I was like. Why would Rabbi Sadi go and come to my my hotel? So, no, he, he described him this he looked like this. Yeah, yeah, he was here. They they caught they caught up to him. I mean, I mean, sorry. And so the hotel owner, sorry, when he realized who he was, he caught up to Rabbi Sadi going. And he fell at his feet and he begged forgiveness. He says, "What are you forgiving me for? So I didn't treat you right. What do you mean you treat me right? You treated me nice. But had I known you were the great Rabbi Sadi I mean, the leader of world Jewry, I would have treated you much differently." And finally, when when the Rabbi Gon came back to students, he had a period he would sit like in the, outside in the snow, and they asked him, "Why do you do that?" He says, "Because every single day, and I think to myself, okay, I accomplished. But 
Then I think to myself, who, was, who am I serving? God. And, and the, oh, if I would have remembered I was serving God, I would have done a lot better. Even though really I didn't do anything wrong. We could always, we could always do a little bit better. No matter who you are, it's not, a, it's not a depressing message. It's an empowering message. You could always do more. You could always do better. You always, always have to push yourself. Easy fast. All the blessings.